We share the success journeys of the elite and learn about the pivotal moments and decisions that shaped their paths to prominence. I'm your host, Nancy Erickson. Today, my esteemed guest is Glenn Capelli. A Western Australian, Glenn has presented messages of dynamic leadership thinking in 33 countries and in over 170 cities. His award-winning USA cable te television series called Born to Learn aired weekly to over 26 million households throughout USA. And his Thinking Caps radio show aired on the Australia's ABC, Radio National, and Melbourne's 3AW. An author, songwriter, triple Hall of Fame life membership, uh, the Professional Speakers Association, and an ongoing example of a lifelong learner. I'm happy to welcome you, Glenn. Ah, good morning and good day to everyone. Yeah, it's good morning to you, and it's the end of the workday for me. So thank you for getting up before dawn for us to record this. I appreciate it. So, Glenn, you've done a lot in your life. So let's kind of start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your growing up years. Where are you from and what was your family life like? And it always does start with the geography, I think. Um, yeah. Here in Australia, uh, as happens all around the world, we often uh, acknowledge the Indigenous to be able to start our story. And one of the wonderful things, yes, I've presented in 170 cities and what have you, but I've also presented in the 14 areas known as the lands. And the lands are the most remote communities in Australia, making them some of the remote communities in the world. And when you're invited to sit in country from the Indigenous Australians, it's it's an absolute honour. Wow. And I think uh, that's what I, we're all born to. It. We're born to that place, that space that we came to. And I came to the planet in the red dirt of Kalgoorlie, edge of the desert, edge of the outback, if you like. Um, yeah. And any time I am reconnected to earth and reconnected to space, Kalgoorlie's got big skies, um, I feel that I'm at home. And it's that that thing, I think, that's actually helped me in life. And any time I feel challenged, I, I look to the sky, I look to the blue sky, I look to the stars, um, the countries that excited me, travelling through East Africa, Arizona, New Mexico, um, the Sinai deserts, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look to the space, look to the sky. Yeah. And when you're troubled, it's like... Hey, and I think that, that starting point at Kalgoorlie, um, later in life, I read Sheldon Kopp, a wonderful psychologist, and he said this. He said, on this hand, on this hand, we, the whole universe was created just for Nancy. The hmm. whole universe was created just for you, Glenn. And in this hand, we're nothing but dirt and ash. <laughs> and I think it's that's that right. somewhere yeah. right. You know, it's and it's a nice remember to look up at the sky and go, "Hey, yeah, I'm a tiny speck." But in well, the it's in, let me just jump in here and say it's interesting that you say look up, because when I look up at home, I don't see much stars because we've got a lot of light pollution in the city. But a week from, you know, I think it's it's coming up. It'll be past tense by the time this airs. But we have a total eclipse of the sun coming through our city again and it, they, you know this is the second time in about 12 years i was in ireland last time when it came so i was disappointed but i'll be here but you know looking up and oh, just you know the magnificence of creation and all it, you do feel like a speck and that you it's a wonderful point nance because the johan hari when he talks about lost connections if we lose connection to the sky living in you know vast cities and lots of lights we lose connection to natural light to sky to dirt to the groundedness of understanding country um if uh, our indigenous here in australia if they're incarcerated imprisoned and they cannot look to open oh. space, it's it's suffering it really is suffering and and for me it's that, that wonderful reconnection to country um and it's not just a a token thing we should do to start a conference. It's um, right. acknowledging country and acknowledging elders. It's a, it's an in heart thing for our own health, mental, physical, spiritual, <laughs> everything. So it, it, I am, it, I'm yeah. fortunate. I was born in born in space and born in uh, in Kalgoorlie. 
Yeah. Well, that's cool. So it's so funny, like, you know, when you talk about the indigenous people, if they're incarcerated, they can't see the sky. So that's, it's torture. It's really suffering. I have a funny story to tell you. My husband is, he's retired from his profession, but he's an international landscape photographer. He travels all over the world to do landscape photography. Um, and he was in Iceland once and there were a lot of, um, Chinese tourists there at the time. And so they usually like to go to remote areas and take pictures, but for some reason they were in a more public area this time. And he was observing two Chinese women who were walking across the grass to this viewpoint and they could barely walk and they were holding on to each other. And it was like, it, it seemed like it was, they were just not stable. And so um, he was talking to the guide and he's goes, what's going on with those women? And he said, you know what? It's not uncommon for visitors from Shanghai to have never been on grass before. They have mm -hmm. never been on earth before. And so um, I, I don't know, that just blew me away. I mean, I like to be barefoot when I'm in the grass, you know, <laughs> and all. But um, our connection to the earth, to the sky, is a really important part of who we are. It's hard to be a fully orbed human being if you can't take in those natural aspects. So, um, yeah, and I and I love how you're um, acknowledging your indigenous people. Um, I appreciate that you started out that way, Glenn. Yeah, it's it's and uh, every time I do a presentation, wherever I'm in the world, I, I do start with an acknowledgement of elders, but but it's a little bit different. I, I start by saying I'd like to acknowledge the elders who have made me who I am. I'd yeah. like to acknowledge the elders who have made you, every audience member, who you are, and acknowledge those elders that walk this planet way before we were even thought of. And and it's not just, a, again, a token thing. I mean, my mum, my dad, they're no longer with us, but they're always with us. Um, of course. And, you know, they feature in every presentation I ever do. You know, the thing, and as I talk, the less messages I've learned from my nana and my papa and from my dad and my mum and people can walk their path of the messages they've learned from their grandparents. Um, and if they don't have grandparents, those respected elders in their life or those people that acted that role. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm a presenter who, some presenters will go, okay, think like this, but I'm, I'm hey, think about this. Um, you know, uh, here's, here's my message to you. Well, no, there's a message to you from inside you and let's find it. And that's the thing that within every human being, there's these in incredible stories. These Believe incredible me, I, I certainly subscribe to that, which is what my work is, right? So, um, so you you've lived and worked all over the world, haven't you, Glenn? Yes, I, I have. It um, and it was interesting how the two phases. So the the traveling around the world with a backpack. Um, and doing all sorts of little jobs and whatever I could do. Um, and then the second part, being an international traveller and speaker and going to countries. So it's um, it's an interesting world uh, how I got to be where I am. And I love your idea of little pivotal moments in life. So, And sometimes what seems like a huge setback in life is actually the door wide opening. You know, it's the sky appearing for you. But... At the time, it didn't seem like it. So all I wanted to be when I was a kid was a professional footballer, Australian rules oh, football. Like I wanted to soccer kick football, you mean? Not American football. No, Australian rules. It's, it's yeah. a crazy oval-shaped ball. It's it's a different game. It's yeah. it's quite wonderful. It's uh, I saw it as art, um, and uh, I was captain of a footy team. I was. Uh, captain of a premiership team when I was just 16 years of age um, at a state level. It was it was huge. And then a, a person ran across my knee in a game of football and they said, you'll never play footy again. And I said, I would. And I got back after two years, oh. but I could never have. And the second time my knee went, that was it. You know, I was never going to be. How's that knee now? That knee now means that instead of running, I walk. Yeah. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but the thing is that at the time, I really thought that was devastating. Oh, yeah. Um, and yet one of the, the greatest things that, you know, we now know in psychology, there's an area that we never, ever looked at. And now we know it's one of the most important areas and it's grit. 
when you get to grit it, you know, when you get to persevere, when you get to find your way through, when you get grit. really challenged. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I was born deaf in all upper registers. I have inner ear things that they cannot mend. So um, I can hear all sounds, but not really high sounds. So, um, but it's not why I love sign language, the language of our deaf communities. But I love signing because it's a beautiful physical learning language. So the physicality of looking to the sky, it would be this. The physicality of grit would be this, finding stuff in your heart and finding your way through. And I think for all of us, you know, sometimes what seems like an incredible kick in the guts that we'll never recover from is really our way to find our grit in it and to grit our way through, which then opens up a whole other world you know so it's and i think that's keeping the hope keeping the hope as you're going through the grit i didn't know that when i was 16 but um what i went through at 16 17 and 18 helped me learn it yeah so tell us a little bit about your travels when did you leave australia for the first time and where have you been since then Yep, I in my university years I always hitched my way around Australia, um, and that was partly because I'd read Jack Kerouac on the road far too many times. Um, but uh, so I I hitched around, and then I became a teacher. I taught English history and economics at a handpicked staff for a government school, an amazing environment. Uh, even though we hadn't talked about learning organisations and high performance workplaces. I got to teach at Wanneroo Senior High School with a handpicked staff, and it was a learning organisation. It was a high performance environment. It was incredible. And but I knew that I wanted to travel. I knew I'd been at school, then at university, then back to school as a teacher, and I needed my world to open up. So I left Australia thinking I'd go travelling for three months, and seven years later, pretty well, I came home. And seven years with a backpack. Um, it was an amazing experience. I, I got to live on a kibbutz in the north of Israel. Um, I had a roommate, a Ukrainian basketball champion who became and still remains my, my best buddy. Wow. Um, and the things you learn, I spent a whole year there. Then I went on to American summer camps and different things around the world. Got back to the north of Israel to visit my friend when I was about... 28, 29 years of age by this stage. And Zhenya, my Ukrainian friend, he says to me, Glenn, we have a party for you. And he's invited all of his friends around. And, and in Israel, there's no light parties. It's, <laughs> it's straight into the guts of it. Um, so he sits me down and he says, Glenn, my friends want to know, you are bum. You are bum. You got nothing, you know, you got what the money in your, your backpack and that's it. Um, what's your insurance for the future? And then they sit back and fold their arms and they're listening. And it was a wonderful question. And I said, mate, I, I don't know. I somehow figure all of this stuff that I have been learning is my insurance for the future. And, and who, who knew it? I mean, in Australia, there wasn't a speaking industry at that stage. But everything I was doing actually prepared me to develop a curriculum to be able to bring to people and to be my own own teacher. So our learning is our insurance for the future. No matter, you don't have to have a backpack for seven years, but you can. Yeah. Um, but it is our insurance for the future. And that ongoing learning in today's world, it's just so fast paced. Everything shifts and changes to remain mm -hmm. open to the learning you can do and embrace new learning, you know, to, to actually stretch yourself beyond, I think. So those years of travel, the people I met, the, the wonderful places, um, it, it really, it developed me with a love of, of the diversity of human beings and finding ways for that diversity. What are the links? What are the connections? What's the teamwork and the collaboration? And at our very best, we can be very, very good at that. At our very worst, it's easy to separate people, divide people and yeah. create a, a binary good, bad, right, wrong, where the good guys, they're the bad guys. Yeah. But finding that way for human beings mm -hmm. to collaborate and connect 
and then be at our very, very best. Who knew yeah. that that's what travel taught me? Yeah, well, you talked about some hot spots, Israel and Ukraine. So your friend who's Ukrainian, is he, I mean, he's not safe in either place, right? Uh, he's uh, he's living in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, he okay. hates what's happening in the world. Um, he's He said, uh, I saw him a few years ago, and we speak every, every week, um, and and Genia, my friend, and I speak to him in my mind, uh, and he features in every presentation. But he said, "Glenn, we have to, we who believe in together, we who believe in people, we have to get better at getting our message across because they are winning. It's an easier message to get across a message of divide. It's a harder message to get uh, of connect." And I think he's right. Their people than to bring people together with common solutions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's and, when and our, me our media in the U.S. feeds on, you know, frightening people. And, um, yeah. you know, everything's fear based. It's not good. It's, you know, there's it's a there's very no, easy. There's no way to come to together in those kind of, you know, circumstances. Yeah, very easy. And I think my whole world and life has been really about finding the the connectivity and going beyond the divisive brain the binary brain you know it's very easy to push that button because it's primal within us protect yourself uh, isolate yourself you know but the the bigger broader sky message grounded to the earth message um, finding ways to be together not only is human to human but human to nature human to planet human to the sky, human to, human to the ground. And that's that's a far trickier way to, to live. It's a far more complex way, but boy, it's a far more exciting adventure too. Yeah, um, well, you, had to, you, were, you were fortunate to get to meet many different people types through all your travels and living amongst people and all. So, um, you know, I was in Israel myself um, a little more than a year ago, last March of 2023. Uh, we were there for a few weeks and um, I'd never been there before because all the biblical sites and stuff that we learned of long ago. But the thing that fascinated me so much is there's the ancient part of Israel and then there's Tel Aviv, which is <laughs> which is like the Mecca of technology and development and so many um, amazing things that they're doing, you know, in the tech industry through Tel Aviv. So. Anyway, it was it was really an interesting juxtaposition of you know like the old world and the new world. So um, we enjoyed that trip a lot. Well, Glenn, tell us a little bit about what you do now. Obviously, you've you know you've spoken all over the world. You have had um, TV shows, radio shows, etc. How how did you get into that aspect of your career? Yeah, I, I was, um, because I learned how to speak Hebrew um, and picking apples on a kibbutz, um, the guy next to me says, oh, you ought to go and work on a summer camp in America. And he explains what that is. And I said, oh, sounds fantastic. I mean, how much is it going to cost me? He said, no, they'll, well, they'll, they'll pay you. Pay you. <laughs> no, not very much, but they'll pay you. Um, and I got employed at Blue Star Camps in North Carolina, and I ended up working there four summers and my was that a Jewish from, camp? Was it for Jewish children? It, it was a Jewish summer camp because yeah, even you know, I'm, spoke I'm not, Hebrew. Yeah. yeah, I'm not Jewish, but a, right. a, a, a Kalgoorlie kid who can speak Hebrew. I mean, <laughs> they'd never With passed. With an Australian up. accent. <laughs> but, um, and it was, it was just staggering. These intense environments, it was kind of like kibbutz on, but on steroids, if you like, a, an intense environment for eight weeks where, um, where friendships are formed for life and deep, yeah. deep friendships. Um, so I had all these incredible experiences and I got a phone call from a brother and my brother never rings me up. You know, and Gary rings me and says, uh, you need to come home to be best man at my wedding. Um, and I've got this program that I wanna run and I'd like you involved in it. So Gary, my brother, took after my Nana. Um, Nana was an entrepreneur, had businesses, sold businesses, and Gary's been very that entrepreneur spirit. Um, so, and this kibbutznik goes back to Australia to be best man at his wedding. Um, and I'm uh, this program that he's running, I, I can instantly see how we can make it 
more meaningful for people in different ways. So I become a, a presenter and a, a writer of that curriculum. I'm interviewed on a TV show about my travels and uh, the producer director of that television program I met on that day and three months later, she becomes Lindy Capelli. So Lindy Hawkins becomes my wife um, and my life changes. Um, I think I'll be running this program um, with my brother. I'll be running a youth program that I've written and I'd be doing what we'd call, I think in America you call it substitute teaching, but we call it relief teaching in Australia. Because I, I, But somehow my program really hitting the right messages for people and families. Um, and I had always said to the young people in the program and the parents in the program, give things a go give things a shot. And I'd torn out a, a thing in my newspaper um, about applying for a Sir Winston Churchill Study Fellowship. Anyone can apply for them. You've got to, uh, and if you can go away to somewhere in the world, learn something meaningful, bring it back to community. So I, and I'm so busy and I'm saying, oh, I'll get around to that, I'll get around. And then I, one day I'm sitting and I look at it and I think, I'm telling these kids, to give things a go, I've got to give this a go. Um, mm -hmm. So I sit down, I get on my typewriter in those days and I type out my application. I get to go to an interview and I receive a Sir Winston Churchill Study Fellowship to go back to America to study ways and means of learning that are going to accelerate and deepen our learning, um, um, particularly for teenagers, language, all, all kinds of learning. Mm. And because it's Sir Winston Churchill, Every university I send a letter to, every person I send an invite, can I do this, would you help me learn this, they open the door. Yeah. And this incredible thing to, you know, that moment where I'm so busy, so busy with sitting down and actually because I was telling the kids give things a go, I gave things a go, you have the message you're about, you have to live and who knew that this Sir Winston Churchill Study Fellowship, as part of it, I did a presentation in America. The professor said, listen, we've got a conference on in Chicago. Can you speak at it? Um, I, then they say, we've got a conference in Boston. Can you speak at it? The Boston people think, say, they go back to Denver and go, well, listen, we, I saw this guy. He'd be great for our TV show. And then they, we do that. And That's then we lovely. get this to from there, one. yeah. It, things lead to things when you yeah, connect it it to people. Um, so let me ask you a question. So they say that uh, public speaking is what most people fear more than anything else. How did you feel that first time they wanted to take you to, what did you say, Boston, to <laughs> to speak on a stage to a group of people? Was that new to you or um, had you had um, any experience with that? I think uh, for all of the teachers out there, um, sometimes teachers think, oh, you know, uh, I couldn't do that or I can't. If you're a teacher and a good teacher and you're in front of kids and you're in front of teenagers and you can engage them and you can help them learn deep stuff, you've got an, an amazing array of skills. Now, some teachers are, are oh, I can teach, but then getting out on a big stage, they you know, say, okay, it's, it's no different really. A little intimidating. Um, yeah, well, yeah, it can be, um, but I always, um, the first time I spoke to the staff at Wanneroo Senior High School, I was 21 years of age, and the principal was impressed with my ethos, if you like, as an educator, and he said, I want you to speak to the whole staff, and, you know, I'm standing up there, my hand's shaking like this, physically shaking, and uh, I said to, and everyone could see the hand shaking as I, and I said, I looked up and I said, oh, I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> and That's a good icebreaker. Yeah. Now, I didn't drink at all. Um, I, I didn't touch alcohol until I was 30 uh, in any way. But as soon as the audience laughed, the hand stilled. And I think it's the true to me to this day that every time I go on stage, uh, there'll be something early where you connect people through laughter, through humour, and then it's like, ah, we're together. We're a team. We're all in this. And sometimes, yes, there will be people sitting there like this, I'm not going to laugh, but a bit of a smile opens up, and somewhere inside that human being, there is a sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere yeah, yeah. deep 
side, there is a sense of humanity, and that's what I present to and until they then decide they're going to show it to the world. Yeah, so how did you, I mean, it, you were just, that's your job is to be a professional speaker. I know you slowed down now in these years. You're not traveling as much at all, but was it hard to get continual speaking engagements or was it, because um, a lot of people who are listening to this want to be a speaker. And yeah. so they, um, um, you know, is it is is it a constant hustle trying to get a gig or, you know, how does how does that work or how did it work for you? Yeah, I think in today's world, it, it to some extent, it does seem like a constant hustle. But um, and if if it had been that when I was younger, I, I wouldn't have done it. Um, I I had a belief that if your message was good and your methodology was really good, then it would spread. Um, and because we were presenting with physicality and humour and musicality, it was different. There was a bit of a uniqueness, um, and I encourage everyone to find their uniqueness. And I always said, the more you do, the more you will do, which which was good because we, we gradually built up. And I, I did a conference. Uh, I learnt that there was Professional Speaking Association. I joined and we were in Australia, the first national conference I ever went to, Bob Johnson, uh, an American speaker, he said, uh, if, any, if you, any of you see, you know, got a colleague who says they've got more than six bookings, they're lying. Nobody's <laughs> got more than, and I was thinking, hold on, we got 20, we got 26. <laughs> um, so I, I re and, and he said, and if, you, if, you, if they're not lying, they need to put their prices up. <laughs> and it was like, okay, there's this world and what we're doing is connecting with people in a slightly different way. Um, and the industry grew um, and the more I was doing, the more I was doing. So in today's world, I, I we live in now Denmark, five hours drive from Perth, pro probably the most isolated place around, but it's just magnificent. It's a very healthy way of living. And we say yes to certain things. You know, I, I, we've got old clients who've been here. If educators ask me, we go in front of them. We go out and we go to schools, communities. And we, we fortunately, through my colleagues, um, one of them said, I, you know, YPO are looking for people to speak. This is Young Presidents Organisation, yeah. huge yeah. international body. And I went down to New Zealand and did one of their family universities. And... These these are the people of influence. You know, they just go, okay, well, six degrees of separation? No, they're two degrees of separation yeah, yeah, yeah. of any human being on the planet. And they just went, okay, you gotta come gotta come to America. You're coming, you're coming over here, you're doing this, you're doing that. And we ended up touring throughout all through Asia, India. And it's just amazing because you weren't just working with business people, you, we were running a family workshop as well. Wow. Um, and it was just so, such an exciting thing. Mm. And, you know, that, yeah, hard work, but it opens the doors. And these these are real-life human beings. And and there was sort of people going, hey, listen, we got a school in Indonesia. Can you go over and, and do something there? Um, so we, Lindy Which and that I... Which takes you back to your educator roots, right? And, and uh, I always, you know, some people say to me, I... You know, you you left teaching for the money, and I said, "Listen, I've never left teaching. I've never left teaching. Yeah. I just wrote a curriculum that there was nowhere to teach it, and I had to find a way to to teach to it. Get it out there, right? So yeah. I'm going to ask so, you about the um, National Speakers Association because they have yeah. chapters all over the United States, and yeah. you were very active and prominent in that group. So, what did they? Did you go there? Um, to get training on how to be a speaker, or what? What did it provide you? The when I was on my Churchill Fellowship in America, the the group that um, I, I joined, if you like, my my collaborators were the International Alliance for Learning. These are people who are looking at methodologies of learning, and, and amazing human beings. I mean, it led me to people like Howard Gardner and Bob Sternberg and Dr. Marion Diamond, one of the first women in neuroscience. And I wanted that sort of connectivity. Mm. And I have it in Australia. Um, so when I got back um, and I was doing stuff, a friend of mine rang me and said, listen, 
I'm supposed to be speaking at a, um, a chapter of the National Speakers Association, yeah. now Professional Speakers Association, and, um, but I, I can't do it. Can you do it? And I went along and presented about methodology that they hadn't really thought about. And I thought, here's, here's a group that could be my, the same, you know, my connectivity mm -hmm. and uh, a made them. And then I thought, there's not enough method here. And one of the guys, wonderful Matt Church, Matt said to me, Cap, uh, don't leave the organisation, change it. Oh, you know, wow. um, make it happen. So um, we started to really get methodology into the Professional Speakers Association. Um, and, uh, you know, I was very fortunate uh, um, because of the uniqueness of how I do what I do that um, awards came away. And I became the 12th member ever to get a life membership. Um, there's now 14 in Australia. The Australian body's linked to all the internationals. And who knew that there's this billion, billion, billion dollar industry? Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. We didn't even know it existed. That's that's amazing. And that's such a great story because you're, what you're telling me is you just walk through the next door and it presented opportunities and the next door and the next door. And then you end up having this incredible life where you're traveling all over the world to deliver these high impact messages. I mean, it's got to be so gratifying. It, it, it's extremely gratifying and it's uh, and it enables us to to do stuff I mean we we learned about a, a chap an Australian guy who was building schools in the south of Bangladesh where no schools had ever existed before mm. and particularly making sure that girls were attending these schools um, and it, it, so we we got in touch with them and we built a school on Bowler Island in Bangladesh and we got 300 kids who attend that school every day, never miss a moment. And another 100 children come every day and queue up at the windows in order to Listen learn. What that in. Yeah, and that is just, that's a message for us all. Yeah, so anytime, you know, if I'm having a rough time or a tough moments, I look to the sky, I keep grounded to the earth, and I think of the kids in Bangladesh and just go, queue up at the windows, mate. There's some learning for you yeah. to do here. Grit it. Find so you've had, you, you really have had a lot of opportunity to use your impact to influence the world. And, um, and I love what you're saying about the children in Bangladesh. You know, when you educate somebody, it goes generational. You know, it just goes on and on and on. Um, and, and, you know, in a lot of places in the world, they don't have secure education. You know, it can't be counted on and all, especially for girls. But um, so how do you feel like you're using your influence now, Glenn, in order to make those, you know, big waves, as I would say? Well, in, in sign language, my signing teacher, Carol Chittaburra, she, she said two things. First of all, she was born deaf and speechless. She said, I feel so sorry for you hearing speaking people because most of you are boring. <laughs> and, said, um, and, you know, we might just talk. But in the deaf community, you've got to bring your emotion to it. Yeah, yeah. And she said, if you don't know a word in signing, you can make it up. So we made up. The word Kaizen is a real word, Japanese, yeah. Chinese symbols. And it means in signing, it's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of improvement yep. every day. And you celebrate each tiny <laughs> little improvement. And that's the thing. It takes this. And then it can kick into this, you know. So sometimes, you know, we, yes, we're invited to go to conferences. Um, we, we present to the people, give them messages that they can learn, not only for their workplace, but for them as a human being, as a parent, as a partner. And when people own it for themselves, I think they then own it for the workplace even more. And then incredible things can, can happen from it. So yes, we do that. But at the same time, there's Probus as an international group where all retirees go and my local town, um, they invited me to speak to the Probus group. So we choose what we do for pro bono and we have some rules around that. But it's equally as exciting to go in front of a group of 60, 80 year olds yeah. to talk about life and learning and ongoing learning yeah as is to go to a big conference or a ypo family university you know human yeah. being we can reach that's awesome uh, if you yeah. reach a 17 year old well even better because they can
can be a tough audience. Oh, you think? Yeah, I would think so. Well, Glenn, thank you so much. I mean, to wrap it up, I'm going to ask you a few just rapid fire questions to help the audience get to know you in a different way. So are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Give it a cat or dog? Uh, cat. Cat? Ooh. You're the first cat person. I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> okay. uh, we had Murray Cat for years. I wrote a radio show. A mere cat? Yeah, yeah, Murray Cat was a ripper. Um, and, uh, you know, people, some people hate cats, um, but Murray Cat taught us messages in life. So yeah. we, uh, we made him famous in Australia. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay, coffee or tea? Coffee. Coffee. Summer or winter? all seasons i'm an all, all seasons of them. guy okay. you know can't be binary on that one it's it's all of them and the okay. noongar here in australia they've got six seasons oh so not just our four six seasons all combining oh wow okay so uh netflix or a movie theater netflix netflix home on the couch with some popcorn that sounds pretty good well okay. you see i you know if i'm at a picture theater and people are making noise then the woman next to me will go they, these people are making noise these people, people are eating their popcorn, you know, and this, so it's far better for that woman next to me to be sitting on a couch at home. Yes, I see uh, what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Glenn, window or aisle seat? Aisle. Aisle. Okay. Morning person or night owl? Always morning. Always morning. morning. Well, yeah, it's really early there right now. So you are a man of many talents and, and you've used those really well, but what is something that you cannot do? Hmm. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a wonderful stumping question. <laughs> uh, do you know, what most, I, you know how most people answer that? I can't tell you how many people have told me that they say, I can't sing. And I'm like, wow, there's like a thread going here. Can you sing, Glenn? Hey, listen, I spoke in Seattle and I said, we're all going to sing a song. And I said, listen, I'm not great at singing. I mean, I'm deaf in upper registers. So my voice just sounds magnificent to me. And this chap, and I said, you know, but I can't sing, but we're going to sing. And this chap came up afterwards and he said, I want to thank you for saying that you cannot sing and then for singing. He said, because I come to a lot of these events and people often say they cannot sing and then they sing and they sing beautifully. Wow. But you, <laughs> you were being honest. <laughs> oh, you were honest. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I love to sing. We can all sing. I love to sing. I just can't do it very well. It or not, yeah. It's exactly. another thing. Well, this has been great. So, where can our audience find you if they want to connect and learn more? Uh, probably the best thing these days would be LinkedIn. Uh, Glenn Capelli, two ends in Glenn, yep. one end from Glenn Miller, one end from Glenn Ford, musician and an actor. Anyway, so Glenn Capelli on LinkedIn. Uh, then zip me a message and we'll send you my direct email. Uh, it's just wonderful to be able to talk with you, Nancy. It's wonderful that we can connect across the world it is. and help people get messages where they can connect and use their influence in their life in a positive way. Yeah. Well, thank you, Glenn, again for your time and to our audience for your attention. Um, if you or someone you know wants to write a book, that's what I do is my profession. I offer my clients a white glove service to write, edit, publish, market, and distribute their books worldwide. So you can find my contact inf information in my LinkedIn profile as well. And there's also a link to schedule a strategy session with me if you just want to chat about your book ideas. So yeah. thank you for your time. You've been watching Masters of Influence with Nancy Erickson. See you next time.